Welcome to an exploration and comparison of surface plasmon resonance and localized surface plasmon resonance. We will explain what surface plasmons are in simple terms and introduce the related phenomena, localized surface plasmons. We will define resonance, compare how resonance conditions are met in SPR and LSPR, and discuss how these technologies can be used for biosensing. Finally, we will consider the advantages of LSPR over SPR for use in in vitro diagnostics. We start by considering what happens when a beam of light traveling through air or water, a non-conductor more generally called a dielectric, reaches the surface of a conducting material or metal. At the interface between the metal and the dielectric, something remarkable happens. Under specific conditions, called the resonant conditions, a traveling surface wave is generated at the impinging point of light. The wave travels along the interface. It is represented in this picture by the intensity contour of the associated electromagnetic field. This wave is called a surface plasmon polariton, commonly referred to as a surface plasmon. To help visualize the surface plasmon wave, picture a wave produced by an object hitting the surface of water. It generates a propagating wave that extends away from the splash point. Analogous to the water waves, in the case of surface plasmons, we can identify three characteristic distances that are pictured in the schematic shown here. First, the evanescent field length in the dielectric that represents how far into the dielectric the surface plasmon wave extends. Second, the evanescent field length in the metal that represents how far into the metal the surface plasmon wave reaches. Third, the surface plasmon propagation distance represents how far from the excitation point the surface plasmon can travel along the metal or dielectric interface. We anticipate that for biosensing purposes, the surface plasmon acts as an antenna. It can sense the presence of analytes in solutions, here the dielectric, up to a distance of the evanescent field in the dielectric. Assuming we use an excitation light with a wavelength around 500 nanometers, let's examine the characteristics of the resulting plasmon lengths in SPR using a planar gold surface. The plasmon field in the metal is in the order of a few nanometers, meaning the surface plasmon does not penetrate deep into the metal. Conversely, the evanescent field in the dielectric can extend from 250 nanometers up to a micron into the dielectric, meaning that the surface plasmon can sense up to a micron away from the surface. Finally, the surface plasmon propagation length can extend a few microns up to the millimeter scale in very ideal situations. If the lateral dimension of the interface becomes much smaller than the plasmon propagation length, the surface plasmon is localized. For example, in this case of a localized surface plasmon for a 20 nanometer silver particle, there is no traveling wave. There is a large increase of the electromagnetic field close to the particle surface, but it extends only a small distance out. Hence, the surface plasmon is localized. If we were to scale both images to their relative size, here is what it would look like. It is immediately apparent that the evanescent field of localized SPR is much shorter than the evanescent field of regular SPR. This means that LSPR senses at a distance of only a few tens of nanometers, while SPR senses at distances up to a micron. Here, we depict the phenomena of resonance in LSPR by demonstrating how different light waves affect the oscillation of a negatively charged electron cloud around a positively charged static ionic core. The system inherently possesses a natural frequency, omega p, at which the oscillation occurs. If we perturb the oscillation at a light frequency different than omega p, most of the impinging light will be scattered. We call this situation off resonance. However, if we perturb the oscillation at a light frequency equal to omega p, the natural frequency of oscillation, the impinging light is absorbed by the oscillation, thereby enhancing its amplitude. As a result, less light will be scattered. We call this case a resonance. 
Notice that the frequency of light is proportional to the inverse of the wavelength color, so resonance can be induced by selecting the appropriate light wavelength. This resonance selection by dialing the appropriate color of light is the hallmark of LSPR. In contrast, SPR has an additional and more stringent condition to fulfill its resonant condition. This stringent condition is momentum conservation. The momentum of the impinging light in air is smaller than the momentum of the surface plasmon. Hence, no excitation of surface plasmon is possible. To meet the resonant condition, the momentum of the light can be increased through adaptive optics, such as an optical prism. Therefore, for a certain wavelength, the momentum of the impinging light is modified to match the momentum of the surface plasmon, and a surface plasmon can then be launched. SPR requires the use of such adaptive optics in order to meet the resonant condition. This poses engineering challenges that will be discussed later. Resonant conditions can be achieved by sending light onto the interface at a certain angle of incidence. If the resonant conditions are met, a surface plasmon is launched at the interface and results in a sharp decay of the reflected light. This can be accomplished by scanning the angle of incidence of light at a fixed wavelength or by using a broad light source with multiple wavelengths. In fact, the resonant conditions in both SPR and LSPR are very sensitive to the nature of the interface. If a thin layer of biomolecules is absorbed onto the interface, the resonant conditions change. Even though the change may be very slight, it is measurable. Both SPR and LSPR result from the interaction between light and a metal surface. As we have learned, the interaction produces a surface wave at the interface called a surface plasmon. There is a notable difference in the instrumental complexity required for SPR versus that for LSPR. In SPR, the energy and momentum matching conditions are stringent and require the use of adaptive optics. For instance, in the Kretschmann configuration displayed on the left side, a p-polarized laser light impinges onto the metal surface after passing through an optical prism. The incident angle is maintained to within 0 0.001 of a degree which also requires precise temperature control to maintain. The reflected light intensity is measured with a detector, which must also be precisely aligned. In contrast, resonant conditions in LSPR are much simpler. LSPR instrumentation consists of a white light source, such as room light or white LEDs, and a detector, such as a spectrometer, camera, or photodiode. In summary, the complexity of LSPR technology resides in the surface of the chip, while the instrumentation used to read the signal is simple. In sharp contrast, the complexity of SPR resides in the precise setup of the instrumentation required to launch a surface plasmon and read it accurately. A second key difference between SPR and LSPR becomes particularly notable in biosensing applications. The difference is in the sensing volume of their respective plasmons captured by what is referred to as bulk effect. Due to the much larger plasmon field of SPR, up to 1,000 nanometers versus LSPR's 40 nanometers, biomolecules that are not actually bound at the sensor surface can be detected in SPR, causing a bulk effect or false positive reading, as depicted by the three unbound biomolecules shown in the sketch. In contrast, in LSPR, only the molecules bound at the surface are captured by the localized surface plasmons. The other three are invisible to the sensor and do not contribute to the signal. Thus, LSPR has marginal bulk effect. In summary, SPR and LSPR are similar sensing technologies enabled by surface plasmons. However, the two technologies differ in several important ways. First, LSPR enjoys a marginal bulk effect due to the small size of the localized plasmon evanescent field. In fact, the large evanescent field of SPR is responsible for the large nonspecific bulk effect and uncontrollable signal fluctuations, which also makes it generally incompatible with complex matrices. 
Due to these and other factors, SPR has not been successfully applied in the diagnostic world, in particular for blood-based immunoassays, where detection of low-level biomarkers requires signal amplification. Second, LSPR can be performed with simple instrumentation. There is no need for adaptive optics, and in fact, room light and the human eye are sufficient to observe some reactions. Further, the LSPR signal is largely temperature independent, so there is no need for thermal controls. Third, LSPR is unique in that amplification steps performed in serum, plasma, urine, or saliva generate precise signals that can be measured for precise target quantitation. Thus, ELISA, for example, can be performed on LSPR with exquisite sensitivity and assay precision. These properties of marginal bulk effect, instrumental simplicity, and its compatibility with different assay enhancements and formats combine to make LSPR an ideal technology for application in diagnostics. Further, LSPR's design flexibility and instrumental simplicity, scalability, and low cost create the opportunity to bring the high sensitivity and quantitative precision of state-of-the-art central lab equipment into miniaturized and mobile formats for point of care. Lambigit is working to bring the future of diagnostics into the present through the power of LSPR. Thank you for listening to our presentation. We welcome your comments. Please email us at info at and learn more by visiting our website, lambigin.com.